ahead and get started. Um, people can keep joining while I'm talking since my part's not the interesting part. Um, I think people know who I am. I'm Kira Kruglikova. Right now I'm the officer in charge of the Division of Conference Management. Um, and so I have the pleasure to welcome everybody to today's event, uh, which is part of the activities to commemorate International Translation Day. So this is an annual celebration and I have to commend Language to Service because they've always done an excellent job in celebrating the hard work that our translators and editors and proofreaders do. So super important work. We're very fortunate today to have Robert Dickinson here who will be speaking today on translation at the League of Nations, a centenary celebration. Robert is an advisor, a reviser in the English translation section in the Division of Conference Management in Geneva. I think we're pretty much everyone's here from DCM, so I think you guys are aware of that. Uh, for some time now, he has been researching the history of the League of Nations translation services using the UNOG's League of Nations archives, which are located here in the library. Robert has been with the UN in Geneva since 2010, except for two years when he was with the International Court of Justice from 2012 to 2014. During his talk, Robert will pay tribute to the groundbreaking work of the League's translators in promoting multilateralism through multilingualism and celebrate the enduring legacy of their work. He will trace the history of the translation services from their beginnings in London in 1919 until the League of Nations last assembly in 1946, focusing on the tireless efforts of translators to meet the changing needs of the League. He will emphasize the continuous thread linking the League's translators with their modern day counterparts in the United Nations. Um, this is a really, it's an excellent talk because of course this is the 100th anniversary of the League of Nations, uh, which is a complicated body and I'm sure Robert will have more to say about that, but certainly sometimes people have the idea that the League was a failed institution. But there were a number of really amazing initiatives that they were quite successful at, including public health issues. Um, but, you know, an institution like that, much like the UN, is really a function of the success of its member states. The League also, of course, was a function of its member states, and we all know what happened. And at some point when the member states don't want to agree, you have to see what happens. But I think this is going to be very interesting. Just some housekeeping matters. Uh, people are aware at this point we've all been doing enough of these virtual meetings. Please keep your mics muted. That just helps to make sure that there's not background noises, et cetera. And Robert will be taking questions after the presentation. So I'd like to turn it over now to Robert and thank you very much for doing this for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Kira, for those um, kind introductory words. Yes, um, of course, we are celebrating this year 100 years of multilateralism in Geneva. And so I think it's entirely appropriate that today, International Translation Day, we should pay tribute to the work of our predecessors at the League of Nations who did so much um, to promote multilateralism through multilingualism. And as Kira said, we'll be exploring the enduring legacy that they bequeathed to us. Um, so just a couple of points uh, before I begin. My talk will take the form of a PowerPoint presentation and I'll be showing a number of documents from our wonderful archives that we have here. Um, you may not, well, certainly will not have time to read them all in extenso during the presentation. So I hope to be making a PDF version of the PowerPoint available um, for you to, to explore further later if you so wish. The meeting is also being recorded as a number of colleagues are unable to attend today. And as Kira said, I'll be happy to um, take any questions at the end of the talk and do my best to answer them. So with that, I'll just um, attempt to share my screen with you and move into PowerPoint mode. So hopefully you can all see that screen unless I hear to the contrary. I'll assume that you can. So what, what I'd like to do in this talk are a number of things, but, but first of all, you can see here um, in this photograph, which was taken in about 1924, the translation sections, and here they're rather um, ghostly figures. And I hope, among other things, to bring some of these people back to life, as it were, tell you a little bit about um, their background before joining the League, how they were, were recruited, and then more generally about the work they did um, while in the League. 
Now, I'd like to frame the talk with um, two quotations from publications that were uh, written by former officials of the League in the middle 40s, when obviously the, the League had well reached its demise almost, and people were looking forward and trying to draw on the lessons learned from the League to inform the new uh, organizations which would uh, arise phoenix-like from the, from the League's ashes, if you like. And uh, the first work I want to refer to is titled the, the International Secretariat. It was um, written by a former official, as I said, Egon Ransoff and Wertheimer, published in, in 1945 and is still the definitive uh, work on the Secretariat, which was, the, of course, the very first international civil service. And you see the subtitle here is a great experiment in international administration. And as Kira alluded uh, to in her introductory talks, there is a, a belief that the, the League was a failure, but in so many ways, um, as she said, it was really very successful. And Ransoff and Wertheimer, for one at least, thought that the experiment that was the translation services was a great success, because this is what he had to say. He was very fulsome in his praise saying that the translation service attained a perfection probably not reached by any service before and certainly never surpassed since. And when you think that the translation service started from scratch in 1919 and had an effective existence of only really 20 years, that's quite a remarkable statement. So we might wonder how the translation services were able to attain such a high level in such a short time. And I think there is a clue to the answer to that question in the next work that we'll look at. And this, again, was produced by a former official, Chester Purvis, who, in fact, at one time had been a translator in the League, published in 1944. And he also picks up on the idea that the League was an experiment. And he says here that the League itself and a fortiori the Secretariat were experimental and their methods accordingly empirical. Reorganization was, so to speak, a standing order. And that goes as well for the translation services, which were, of course, part of the League. And in the course of my talk, what I hope to show is that the translation services were always being reorganized, reorganized to ensure that they operated as effectively and as efficiently as possible, that they recruited and retained the very best people. And we'll see that there were a number of real important reorganizations that took place in the 1920s and the beginning of 1930s, so over a course of about 10 years, which put the translation services on a very firm foundation and really it created a model for the services that we have today in the UN family. Now, where can we begin this talk? Well, I, I think there's no better place than the Paris Peace Conference and no better time than the 28th of April, 1919, because this was the day when finally the covenant of the League of Nations was adopted. And here you can see how this event was captured the following day in the Journal de Genève. And two things are highlighted here. First, it was announced by President Wilson at the peace conference that the seat of the League would be in Geneva. And he also announced the, the name of the Secretary General of the League. And that was Sir Eric Drummond, a, a senior British civil servant who had been actively involved in the negotiations in Paris. Now, the expectation was that uh, the Versailles Peace Treaty, of, of which the Covenant was an integral part, it was the first part of that treaty, would be ratified and enter into force relatively quickly, certainly before the end of the year. So there was a certain sense of urgency in establishing the Secretariat. 
in order to prepare, among other things, for the first meetings of the, the Council and the Assembly, which were the two principal organs of the League, along with the Secretariat. And so to, to that end, an organisation committee was put in place. And the organisation committee held its first meeting on the 5th of May 1919 in Paris in the Hotel Crillon, which was the headquarters of the American delegation to negotiate the peace. And you see here there are two documents. Um, the first on, on the left is an extract from the minutes or well, press communique of the first meeting of that committee. And you'll see that there were nine uh, members present and they represented the states who would in fact make up the very first council. And they took a number of resolutions. Um, one important resolution was that the, the acting secretary general, Drummond, be instructed to prepare plans of organization of the league and to submit them to the committee and that a credit of £100,000 should be open immediately for for him to get to work. And on the right, you can see a note from Hanke, who was the British secretary at the Paris Peace Conference to Sir Eric, um, informing him that Clemenceau, President Wilson and Lloyd George had authorised him to establish the temporary and provisional organisation of the League of Nations in London. So the first home of the League was in fact in London. So Sir Eric Drummond took no time in returning to his London home here, number 23, Manchester Square, which if you like, was almost the first headquarters of the League. And there in, in the back drawing room of number 23, working with a very few, um, a very small number of collaborators, um, particularly Jean Monnet, who would become the first uh, Deputy Sec Secretary General of the League, Drummond set about a number of priorities. First thing he did was to send uh, a letter to the British Foreign Office requesting uh, an overdraft of £15,000. But then what he had to do was to actually plan the organisation of the Secretariat, find premises and start recruiting, at the very least, a skeleton staff. Now, what did the, the Covenant have to say about the Secretariat? Well, not very much, really. It simply said that the Permanent Secretariat shall be established at the seat of the League. So, really, Drummond had a, a clean slate to decide how he would organise the work of the Secretariat. And what he decided to do was to organise it along functional lines. And here we can see a very first draft of the organisational structure of the Secretariat. And we can almost imagine uh, Drummond together with Monet and Raymond Fosdick, the American who would become Assistant Secretary General, um, getting out their pens and rulers uh, and drawing up this first draft, which remarkably, um, and this is a great tribute to, to Sir Eric, actually remain pretty much the same throughout the life of the, the League. It only changed in 1939 when the League was scaling down its operations. So you see on, on the left, there are a number of sections under the Deputy Secretary General. And each of these sections has their constitutional basis in the various provisions of the Covenant. So for example, if you look at the number seven, the treaties section, the task of that section had their origins in Article 18 of the, the Covenant, which stated that any treaty or international agreement entered into by a member of the League had to be registered with the Secretariat and published by the Secretariat for it to have binding force. The idea being that this would put an end to the kind of secret diplomacy that had gone on, for example, during the war. And on the, the right, you can see the internal administration services, which were placed under the Under Secretary General. Now, the, the Covenant was not only didn't have very much to say about the, the structure of the Secretariat itself, it actually had nothing to say about the official languages of the League. But it was just 
taken as quite natural that those official languages would be English and French, following on from the two official languages that have been used at the Paris Peace Conference. So here we see that um, correspondence has to be in French and English, uh, and of course the staff members must be bilingual. Now, although the League only had these two official languages, French and English, in fact, the translation and interpreting department had to deal with many, many more languages, because although secretariat documents were issued only in those two languages, member states could submit documents to the League for translation. And the head of the translation service was reporting in uh, as early as no November 1920 that the services were in a position to translate from as many as 12 languages. So it really was uh, a multilingual organization. Now, having decided on the structure of the Secretariat itself, he needed to find premises and premises were made available to him by the British government. And the, the first headquarters, properly speaking, in London were in Sunderland House, um, a rather fancy mansion just off Piccadilly, which was not perhaps the best place um, for offices of an organisation of the type of the League. Um, what one senior official described the mansion as ugly, inconvenient and uncomfortable. But fortunately, there were other offices just very nearby in Piccadilly, which were much more conducive um, to, to work. And the information section, the economic and financial section and the library services were housed there. So he, he, now that he had premises at the same time, of course, he needed to find staff. And if, he was in an awkward position in as much as any appointments that he made were provisional and subject to approval by the assembly when it actually met. However, he, he had no need to advertise for posts because there were very many people who were very keen indeed to work to serve the League in some form or other. Now, Sir Eric needed to find very quickly, he realised, a head for the translation service. And as I said, he, he was receiving from a lot of people recommendations um, for individuals who had certain talents, who were certainly very keen to work for the League. And he received one letter from the British ambassador in Bern recommending a certain Denis Parodi um, as a very competent official who was very keen to work for the League. Parodi had, had served um, as a kind of agent for the British ambassador during the, the war. And in fact, he had uh, accommodated General Smuts um, from South Africa during the war, who was on a mission to try and see if he could broker a separate peace with the Austrians. So he was a well-known figure in many respects. And what caught Drummond's eye was the fact that Parodi was a Swiss national and moreover from Geneva. And it seems for, for whatever reason, political we suppose, he was keen that the head of the translation service should be a Swiss national. Now, when Rumble wrote first to uh, Sir Eric, he made no mention of any interest on the part of Parodi in becoming a head of a translation service or even a translator. And Drummond wanted Rumbold's opinion on that to see if, in fact, he, he would be a good person to head the department. So here we have a letter from Rumbold saying that, well, yes, um, he would be a good candidate. He knows four languages, English, French, German, Italian, considerable administrative experience working um, in the civil service in Egypt. And he ends up saying, I don't think you could get a better man for your purposes. So Drummond ran this past uh, Jean Monnet, who 
as we see here, was quite agreeable to Parodi's appointment. And Horace Rumpold, when he heard the news, was very pleased. And we'll see here in the final lines of his letter, he says, Dr. Parodi will be very pleased, and I'm sure you will not have cause to regret your decision. We shall see in a few moments that, in fact, Sir Eric probably did have um, great cause to regret his decision. Now, you can see that uh, letter was drafted in, in September 1919. Well, the year was passing, and in fact, the year ended without the Treaty of Versailles coming into force. But the good news is that right at the beginning of 1920, the Covenant did enter into force uh, on January the 10th, and we can see here the New York Times capturing that in the next day. And so now this triggered a number of uh, actions. And the very first one was that the League's first council meeting would take place in Paris uh, six days later on January the 16th. And here we have a photograph of the, the clock room at the Quai d'Orsay with Leon Bourgeois presiding. And, and a couple, this was a very short meeting, but a few decisions were, were taken, mainly to set up a SAR commission to, to govern a territory which had been placed under the League's responsibility. And also the council instructed the uh, secretariat to convene an economic conference in Brussels later that year. So as I say, uh, now the League could start its activities properly. And so apart from the uh, Brussels conference, which we'll see in a moment, uh, an advisory committee was established to draw up the statute of the Permanent Court of International Justice, which had a, a close relationship with the, with the League. And so the translators, pracy writers and the interpreters headed off from London to The Hague to service this um, meeting of the advisory committee in the summer of 1920. And just as an aside here, um, I'll say that the, the, the records are of this, uh, these committee meetings, which were drafted by the pracy writers of the League, um, have been referred to extensively by the International Law Commission in their most recent session held in, in 2019 uh, in consideration of their topic, General Principles of Law. So I, I think this is testament, if any were needed, to the enduring value of well-drafted summary records that 100 years later, that they, they still have enormous value for international lawyers. So also the... Um, Translation services travelled to, to Brussels to take part, to cover the financial conference there in, in the autumn of 1920. And you can see on, on the left, and this is interesting, a uh, letter, letterhead from the uh, international conference from Parodi to Jean Monnet, um, requesting Monnet to authorise the appointment of, of a translator for the conference. Now, if you see, the conference ended on the 8th of October, and this letter was dated the 2nd of October, asking for a translator for the conference. So that seems rather odd, um, but he's sending that letter rather late and gives us a hint that things were not particularly well on the administrative side. Now, the Versailles Peace Treaty having entered into force, now it was known that the first assembly of the League would meet in Geneva towards the end of the year. So there was a certain sense of urgency now of transferring the, the Secretariat from London to Geneva. And in fact, at the end of October that year, around the 24th of October, I think a special train were, was chartered and brought all the members of the Secretariat from London to Geneva. But of course, prior to that, a premises had to be acquired in Geneva. And in the summer of that year, the commission um, established to 
purchase those premises. You can see the Members Site Commission in the bottom left hand picture. Acquired the former Hotel Nacional, uh, the largest hotel. I think it had 270 rooms, the largest hotel in Western uh, Switzerland and required quite a bit of renovation work. And I'm sure you'll recognize um, the building as the current Palais Wilson, um, which was in fact the very first uh, Palais des Nations and was the home of the Secretariat from 1920 until about 1936 when the new Palais was built. And so the Secretariat took up um, its offices here in Geneva and started preparing for the very first assembly. And the assembly was held from the middle of November to the middle of December in the Salle de la Reformation. There were 42 members of the League of Nations in 1920. And in all, some 63 states were members at one time or another of the League. Generally, the assembly were held, was held as now um, on the first Monday in September. And this uh, assembly was really a baptism of fire for the translation services because there were already a small number of permanent members of the translation service. But of course, to be able to service all these meetings that were taking place, many uh, temporary staff had to be taken on board. And this really put to the test Parodi's administrative skills and unfortunately he, he failed big time as we shall see and also apart from priorities failings following the experience of the first assembly a review was taken of the translation services as, as a whole and consideration was given to exactly what kind of person what was needed as a translator for the league so returning to, to Parodi, we see a, a letter here that was dated in 14th of March 1921, but which basically deals with events um, in November, December uh, 1920, um, because in, in March 1921, I'm afraid Parodi had also overstepped the limit and that he was rather too free in his words to a French journalist. But we see here um, that already in December, at the end of the assembly, it was very clear that Parodi was, as we say here, he had a complete incapacité. He was completely incompetent and that things could not continue as they were. So a decision was, was taken to, to sideline Parodi for a certain time and to appoint two heads of section, one for the English section and one for the French section. But the underlying problems were that Parodi had taken on staff, sometimes with no written agreement, sometimes it was just simply verbal, offering staff different rates of pay for the same job. And in fact, during the um, First Assembly, one of the interpreters issued an ultimatum and almost threatened to go on strike because he felt that um, Parodi had gone back on his word. And at the same time, it's apparent here from this text that the people who had been recruited were of very uneven standard, that some people who had been offered permanent positions were really not up to the job. So a root and branch reorganization was necessary. But also, as I said, this was an opportunity to actually think about the type of people who, who would make good translators. And part of this review, a close collaborator of Sir Eric Drummond, Francis Walters, who would eventually become Deputy Secretary General much later, drew up a memorandum. And he was very concerned, as, as was Drummond himself, that the calibre of the people who were being recruited was, was very high and that they probably would not reconcile themselves to remaining within the translation section, would look for jobs with 
more responsibility. And this would lead to a certain sense of instability. And the heads of the translation sections said that actually they needed these people. They needed really high quality people with, with great general skills, not just language skills. And Walters disagreed. As you can see here, and he says that he doesn't agree with Dumoulin, who was the head of the French service, that translation requires all that rare combination of qualities which is claimed. In fact, he says, translating is an art and is often found in people who have no other very unusual qualities. And then he goes on to say, it's also an art which is frequently possessed by women. So his proposal was that the new translation section organization should be based on having a head of section for, for the department as a whole, and then one head of the French and another of the English sections, and then basically what he calls a staff of women of university education. Now, what was his thinking behind this? Well, basically, his idea was that there were a lot of women emerging from universities in, in Oxford, Cambridge, London and Paris and so on, who had very few career prospects. Basically, he was saying that all they could aspire to was becoming schoolmistresses on a relatively low salary. So for him, he thought, well, we can, we, the league, can practically have our pick of these women. All we have to do is to keep them working here under fair conditions for a fair period of time to see whether they have a real translating gift or not. Now, the interesting thing here is, is the use of the adjective fair. What does Walters consider to be fair conditions and what for him is a fair period of time? Well, the answer to the first question, fair conditions, becomes quite clear. Basically, he's saying that the, these women, as he called them, would be happy to start on the pay grade of bilingual stenographers and have an annual increase. And as he says, they would realise from the first that they came with a definitely limited job, definitely limited prospects, and you would eventually have a staff, many of whom had done translating here for many years, who would know the work a fond. So, this is very interesting because at the beginning, the translators were seen very much as clerical staff. So here he's placing them on the same level, stenographers, um, bilingual stenographers. Now, the great advantage of this is not only would you have, in his view, a staff that were stable because they didn't aspire to anything more, but you would actually pay them a lot less than men. Now, Walters, I think, had really missed the boat here and didn't realise that the world had changed. On the one hand, he didn't realise that women, university women in particular, were, were no longer reconciled to being second-class citizens or second-class employees, as illustrated in this letter, which was an application sent to the League the following year um, by a woman, Hilda May, who points out, she says, I've been given to understand that appointments on the League of Nations are open equally to men and women. She's almost quoting there from Article 7 of the Covenant. And then she goes on to make the point that she's not inquiring about posts for shorthand typists. She stresses that she's a university woman trained in social science and administration and have had, has held responsible administrative secretarial posts. Um, so Walter's scheme was never going to work, really. And another interesting point in her letter is that she was very keen to work for the League, as many people were. They were devoted to the ideals of the League. So, at one level, Waters was, was completely wrong about women not aspiring to more responsible posts. And on the other level, he, he completely misunderstood 
the demands of the service. And we have here a memorandum by Dumoulin, which is, I think, fascinating, because he talks about the situation in which the, the French service at least found itself in early 1921. And he says it has to be thoroughly reorganized on a new basis. And his language is very interesting. It said until lately it had been scraped together as occasion offered in a very haphazard way. And it's working partook of the nature of a makeshift more than a definite organization. And the situation that he found himself with was that within his section, he had translators of different there were varying skills, if you like. Some were really quite proficient, others less so. And what solution he came up with was to institute two grades of translators. On the one hand, those who were already pro quite proficient, who would be on a higher grade, and, and those who were really still um, learning the ropes, if you were, who would be on a, on a lower grade. Now, the English section found itself in, in a different situation. And this is a note from uh, Dennis, um, Geoffrey Dennis, who was the head of the, the English section, who, who said that in fact the, the English section was much more homogenous and that it would be invidious in fact to, to create two levels of translator within the section. And his solution was to have a pay grade that, that was the average of the two grades that the French section would have. And then interestingly, he, he goes on to address, um, so that's there, Walter's point about um, the desirability of, of having women in order to have a service that was more stable. And he seemed to go along with that, but unlike Walter's, he, he didn't think it would be that easy to, to find women who were suitable candidates. And the very last sentence here, he says, this was strikingly exemplified in the test I held last autumn, when only one out of six carefully picked women had a decent idea of the English language. So that, among other things, says quite a bit about Dennis, but particularly about the emphasis he would always put on in the English section of people being able to draft well in English. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that, of course, in later tests, he was able to recruit some outstanding women who um, Waters might have been surprised to know were actually very ambitious and, and wanted to move on into other sections as time went on. So following this reorganization, we see here we're moving from on the left to the original setup where you had everybody together in the same uh, section to on the right, the new system where you had two separate sections, two separate chiefs, the French section with two different pay grades and the English section with basically just one pay grade with some annual increments there. So that was a reorganization within the section, translation section itself. But also there was a, a major review of the structure of the secretariat, which had been requested by at the first assembly meeting and which reported a committee of experts headed by rapporteur Georges Noblemer um, presented his report to the fourth committee which dealt with staff affairs in 1921 and that was approved um, by the second committee second assembly in that year and he made a recommendation concerning the translation services and the committee recommended that the work of the translator and interpreter section should be combined with that of the Precy writing department. And as he explains, this would result in giving the staff of the combined section more variety in their work and would also provide greater elasticity, especially at times of pressure. Now that seemed to be a very sensible recommendation, but for some reason was not taken up until some 10 years later when another Committee of Inquiry, which we'll see in a moment, uh, made the same recommendation to, in fact, expand that somewhat to create a documentation division. So another reorganization that took place in 1923 
which was brought about by Sir Eric Drummond because he was concerned, still concerned, that the people who were being recruited to the language services were, were of a very high calibre and that they, they needed some kind of career prospects. And initially, uh, in the 1919, 1920, he had sent letters around to various sections saying, look, you know, we've got some really good people here. When you're filling vacancies, think about them. But um, in practice, that was not possible because there was an over-representation of British and, and French nationals on the secretariat and in the interests of an equitable geographical um, distribution of posts. In, in fact, it was very, very difficult, almost impossible for any of the translators to move in, into any of the other technical sections. So what he proposed was to to create new posts within the translation sections to reflect, as he said, not merely the linguistic knowledge, but the general technical knowledge and intelligence of, of the staff. So basically, he advocated posts to recognize people's ability to work both as translators and as interpreters, and also people who were more experienced and were able to revise the work of others. So to create the post of revisers. And so the two posts of um, translator interpreter would be created within each section and two posts of translator reviser. So this then produced this kind of setup. So you see here on the left, the French section with the chief of service and then Georges Meyer, who was a translator reviser and then Monsieur Biou, who was interpreter and translator. And then on the other side, the English section, Jack Dennis is the chief of service, Lady Blenna Hassett is a translator reviser, and then two translator interpreters, um, Colonel Wade and, and Mr. Russell. And if you look a little bit further down there, you'll see the name Mr. C. Purvis, that's Chester Purvis, whose work I referred to earlier. So here we have some names of some of the translators. De Melon, Meyer, Bouchard, um, Patterson, Purvis. So let's put some faces uh, to these names. So here we return to the photograph from 1924, I think. And um, we're going to bring them a little bit to life. And I'm going to introduce some of these translators to you and tell you a little, a little bit about them. Now, sitting there in the, in the center of the picture, looking straight at us, is Geoffrey Dennis, who is, as you've seen, the head of the, the English section. Dennis uh, had a brilliant mind, took a first degree in history in, in Oxford, Alpha in all subjects. During the war, he was the chief army lecturer in history and English at the Rhine Army College worked as a captain in the military as a liaison officer with the French Eighth Army. In 1919, he passed third in the whole of Great Britain in the civil service exam. And it's a remarkable achievement. But he wanted to work for the League. So he, he was recruited fairly early on by Parodi, a good move on his part, and came to be the head of the English section and later would in fact become the head of the documentation division. Um, as I mentioned before, Dennis put a great deal of emphasis on translators' knowledge of English and their ability to draft well, which I think reflects the fact that he himself was a very fine writer. He was an acclaimed author. He won the Orsenden Prize for Literature in 1930. And unfortunately, it was his literary endeavours which led to his, his sad departure from the League, um, he, he wrote a book entitled Coronation Commentary, which was to mark the coronation of Edward VIII in England. And of course, Edward was never crowned, he, he abdicated. And he actually took offence at some of the um, comments that Dennis made in what was overall a sympathetic portrait of Edward, and he sued him. And for good measure, Winston Churchill also sued him for comments that he made about, about Churchill. And so it was a great scandal and uh, Dennis had to leave. 
under something of a cloud, unfortunately, but I'm pleased to say that he bounced back after the war. He went to work for UNESCO uh, and finished his career there. Lady Blenna Hassett, um, in a moment, we'll see that she was recruited in 1919. She was a, a um, her father was a Bavarian aristocrat, her mother an English lady. She, her husband, um, had died in India in 1915, so she was a widow with a son, 17-year-old son, joined the secretariat in 1919 and served with enormous distinction until her retirement. And as we'll see later, she was extremely devoted to the League and came back for its uh, last assembly in 1946. Colonel Wade, um, a, a military man, um, during the war, he served in the War Office and he was an editor of military journals and also the chief of research of the League of Nations Union. So again, someone who was firmly committed to the ideals of the League and he eventually would go to work for the Permanent Court of International Justice as an interpreter in 1931. Thomas Patterson, um, Scotsman, first class honours in, in English from Edinburgh. He also worked at the same um, Rhineland College as, as Dennis, so knew him there, joined the League. He stayed on beyond his retirement to take over the head of the section when Lady Blenheim Hassett uh, retired. And here we have Chester Purvis, who, who wrote the um, book I referred to earlier. Very interesting character. He passed the 1922 exam, which we'll be talking about in a moment. And I think he found translation a bit monotonous. He was always looking for something else to do. He was seconded. Um, to a reparations payment office in Berlin, then worked on a commission of inquiry on the production of opium, and finally ended up in the personnel department. And one was, was one of the very last officials to leave the League in um, 1947, in fact. So those are some of the English members, and you'll see that very few of them had degrees in, in languages, well, none of those in foreign languages, none of them did. The French section was rather different. It had a much more academic background. Here we have Georges de Mono, who was the head of the service, a uh, teacher at the Lycée Voltaire in Paris, an interpreter at the Peace Conference, and then remained as the head of the section until 1939. Um, this is Monsieur Maillet, a graduate in German studies before the war. He lectured in French School of Commerce in Berlin, worked as a translator for the Avas Agency after the war, um, joined the League very early on, 1920, and remained with it until May 1940. Um, Georges Meyer, uh, he was like um, de Moulin, was a teacher. He was at the Lycée Condorcet, recruited in 1921, remained with the League throughout its life, and eventually would join, as we shall see, the UN um, in Geneva. Pierre Boucherin, um, graduate of the École Normale Supérieure with a higher diploma in English from Sorbonne. He was teaching in University of Sheffield in England when he was recruited in 1920, and he resigned in May 1940. And finally, um, Baron Onactin from Brittany, he learned Russian when he was um, held captive throughout the duration of the First World War, recruited in 1919, and very soon after this photo was taken, went to join um, the Permanent Court of International Justice as an interpreter in 1925. Now, the size of the services varied over the years, starting from quite small beginnings in uh, 1920, and I've combined here the numbers of the Precy Writing Service at that time. Um, and then it grew steadily over the years, reaching a peak in 1933. And the at that time, the League was facing a great economic crisis um, because of the Depression, and each section actually had to let a member go. Um, uh, and then the numbers tailed off gradually, remaining at just above 30 
1939. And then during the war, in fact, there was really only one, one and a half translators who remained in Geneva, as we shall see in a moment. Now, in terms of recruitment, as we saw, de Moulin described it as rather haphazard at the beginning, but well, that was almost the very nature of, of the way the organization started. And we'll just have a look at a couple of examples. Here we have a letter from Jean Monnet um, talking about Onacta, who we just met, who came with a recommendation, Monet interviewed him, and then sent him off home with a translation to do. This is the translation he was given. It's obviously about the organization committee of the League and the difficulties it was facing. So he did, duly did the translation at home with all the resources that he had, and then Monet wasn't quite sure what to do with it. So he actually sent it to Pierre Comer, who is the head of the information service, a French journalist, for him to have a look at. And obviously he thought it was good enough and Onactan was taken on board. Parodi, when he was appointed, put in place a sort of competitive exam. And this was the paper he set for the English um, exam. There were some 11 candidates. And this is Lady Blenna Hassett's um, translation in, in her fair hand. We can see it took her about 50 minutes to do. And also the second part of the translation was actually the drafting of a letter, uh, because at the time that was one of the roles of the translation department to, to draft letters. And we can see here her letter and we can see written in there by Parodi that she scored very highly and he's noted the other languages that she has, German, Italian and some Spanish. However, um, the Noble Mayor report um, said that recruitment should be put on a, on a more robust footing and they recommended in the second paragraph that um, in general recruitment should be by competitive selection. So a system of competitive exams was put in place and these were held regularly. Here I have statistics for the English exams in the 1920s, you can see that they were held at sort of three, two year intervals and they attracted a number of candidates, a lot of candidates on, on average. There were something like 200 applications. They were whittled down on the basis of their um, paper qualifications, if you like, to some generally 40 candidates who would sit the written test. Of those, about one quarter, so 10, 11 or thereabouts, would qualify for a probationary period. That meant that they were invited to come to Geneva, generally around the assembly period, to work to see if they were really of the required standard. And generally speaking, of those 10 or 12 or so that carry out this probationary period, only two or three were ever actually offered permanent posts. So it was an extremely selective process. And the process was made um, very public. Advertisements were placed in the leading newspapers, French and English newspapers in London, Paris, Geneva, and so on. So you see advertisements here, 1921, 1924, for English exams, setting out the requirements and a slightly later advertisement, 1929, for the, the French um, competitive exam advertised in, in Le Temps. So this attracted obviously many applications. What I want to do very quickly is just take you through um, the English competitive exam in 1922. And we have here a letter on the left from Dennis to one of his temporary staff members, Mrs Adams, inviting her to join the interview board. And the exam would take place in the building on the left, what was then Trafalgar House. And the building on the right is um, Cadogan Square, and some buildings in Cadogan Square, very nice residence where Miss Adams lived. And in the second letter, it's interesting, um, Dennis says that uh, Sir Eric Drummond has decided that it must be an advertisement. So we're going to be flooded with people. And in fact, there were 60 people who took that test. So I just want to take you through the, the actual test of one applicant. 
uh, a, a woman. Um, and here she had seen the advertisement in the Times, wrote to Dennis setting out her experience. And she obviously had a very interesting experience from Dennis' point of view. She'd worked for the intelligence department of the Admiralty. She had technical knowledge. She had um, good French and good Italian. So this was a very interesting candidate. So Dennis replied positively, saying that it seems that she did have the necessary qualifications, explaining what the exam would consist of, two papers, one official, one technical French into English, and then another paper with another language, Spanish or German or Italian. But he also says very clearly that the standard of candidates so far selected to sit this test is exceedingly high. So he always made very clear that the prospects of actually securing a permanent post were, were very small. And we see from this um, postcard that Ms. Fitzmaurice decides to take the exam in London and all the candidates had to fill in this form with their details. And we can see at the top right is the score that Ms. Fitzmaurice was given by the interview board, the selection panel there. And we can see here the papers. The first paper was a general paper. It was a statement made at the first assembly, rather high flown language. The second one was a more technical um, text, but not very technical. It was really about air legislation, but more descriptive, written for the general public really, rather than experts. Then there was a slightly more technical one, uh, a Belgian decree about ex exchange control, so, so commercial terms there. And you can see that very few um, marks made by the examiners here. So this was a strong test. And then she also offered Italian, and this is the last page of the Italian uh, test. And you can see the, the comments of the examiners, very good paper, very strong French, very good English, and pretty good um, Italian. And she, in fact, passed second in the test. So she had this probationary period, but unfortunately, she didn't come up to the level required for a permanent post, as Dennis makes clear in this note. And what's interesting, he, he says that the drawbacks really were her lack of speed and more important, her lack of adaptability to our methods of work in the section. For example, dictating translations to typists. Um, so she wasn't quite good enough to be permanent member of staff, but she was put added to his list of temporaries and would come back to work, for example, during busy periods. Now, I alluded earlier to another committee of inquiry. This is the committee of 13 who reported in 1930 and had some things to say about the translation and interpreting and precy writing services. And the committee wanted to put the translators on a, on a sounder footing. Their status up to them had been somewhat indefinite. As I said, that they started out almost like clerical staffed and they wanted to assimilate them to the top grade of officials, the first division. And here we said that because of their high qualifications, the importance of their duties, they should be assimilated to members of section. So that meant that they would have the same status, the same salary, conditions of employment, and the same diplomatic immunities. And the other important um, change that was recommended was that the different services should be placed under a document documentation service. So at last, the Precy Writing Service joins the translation service. And at the head of, of this, well, it would be Jeffrey Dennis, who would be the, what was known as the editor, who had in fact enormous um, powers that he, he was able to actually veto the issuance of certain documents, recommend that certain documents be adapted or shortened. Um, it's a very important position. And Egon ransov Bedheimer obviously approved this because he knew what importance the translation services played in its smooth functioning. 
of the League and he pays a great tribute here to their work and he's glad that at last their status is fully recognised within the organisational structure of the League. And this is, is how things then were organised. So we had the document services with Dennis at the head and then the two um, translation sections and we see that Lady Blennerhassett has been promoted to take uh, Dennis's place. Now, all the while, the work of the League was becoming increasingly technical and the competitive exam had to reflect that. So we'll just have a quick look at two exams from 1936, the French competitive exam. And you see here the English text, which had to be translated. It's a financial text. And this is, a, is obviously a text which is addressed to other financial readers, not the general public. And here is an attempt made by one of the applicants to translate that. And you can see that there are a number of gaps um, in the translation. The person, what's more, was unable to finish it in the, the time given. So it was really quite challenging. And the other text that applicants had to translate was a medical text. And again, this was really a pretty tough uh, job for someone to do under examination conditions. Here, the, the applicant did a rather better job, seemed to sort of acceptable, but still some gaps. And similarly, the, the English examinations were pretty tough as well. I don't have the original French, but you can see from the English translation here that these medical texts were really very demanding. Um, and the other text that they were asked to translate was a completely different nature. And here it's all about the transmission of radio waves and really quite detailed work. And uh, this translation was actually done by a translator called Vernon Barker, who was, who was an excellent translator, as you can see. He did a very proficient job. So what were all these translators doing? Well, we saw that they had gone initially to, to The Hague to cover meetings there. They'd gone to Brussels. They travelled around a lot in the early years. So one of the major conferences that they attended first in 1929 was an important um, conference on communications and transit in Barcelona, at which two major uh, conventions were adopted. They returned to The Hague for the opening session of the Permanent Court in 1922. They covered a very important World Economic Conference that had been convened at the request of France. Uh, the Sixth Assembly in 1925, and it was attended by 50 states, including the USA and the USSR. Then there was the really very, very big conference, the Disarmament Conference, which lasted for two years, from 32 to 34. Um, temporary structures had to be built next to the Palais des Nations, the Palais Wilson, if you like, to accommodate all the delegates. Apparently, the acoustics were awful. But those um, buildings were, were kept in place uh, until the move to the current Palais des Nations. Another major monetary and economic conference held in London, an ILO conference um, in 1933. And all the while, they were also serving the, the committees which were meeting regularly in Geneva, all these committees. And they were working very hard. You could see that their output um, grew steadily over the 1920s. I have statistics here for the English translation section. And then the more detailed statistics were kept in the 1930s. And you can see that they were constantly above 20,000 pages per year, sometimes over 25,000. And obviously the interpreters who were within the service really had very little time for any translation work. The Precy writers were able to do a little but not much because they were very busy with their other activities. The French section, very similar. It seemed Precy writers perhaps had a bit more time because most of the delegates who spoke in meetings took the floor in French. So the English had more work to do there in translating those records. Um, and we can just see how they compare over the years. Sometimes the French were producing more, sometimes the English were producing more for various reasons, but 
a lot of work was being done. And a lot of that work was very technical, as I said. Here in 1933, you could see that the, the English section translating huge number of documents for the disarmament conference. Many, many more than all the other sections. The French had few, uh, relatively few documents for the disarmament conference, mostly economic and financial and then the opium uh, committee. And we see the comparison here. The French had more on the opium committee because most of the proceedings of that committee were in English simply by the nature of the problem, which concerned mainly countries in the Far East where French was not necessarily spoken a lot. And it, re, returning to Purvis, um, he pays great tribute to the work of the translators in trying to keep up with this increasing specialization. Um, it was extremely difficult. As he says, it was a heroic task for the interpreter and translator who specialized in say health or economic questions. And he explains that they were able to do it because of the zeal that they had for, for, the, for the organization itself. But he felt that it earned but scant appreciation and it put a serious strain on some. And he made some recommendations which were interesting for the future organization. Now, all the time that this was going on, um, the new palais was under construction, been decided in 1929. These screenshots here are from 1933. And eventually, the translation section was able to move into its new quarters in, in 1936. And I'm sure you can recognize this part of the palais. Um, you'll see that the sections were slightly larger slightly older than they had been, and there were a few more women. There were, at that time, there were four women translators in the English section, and just one uh, in, in the French section. But they were not going to be there for very long, unfortunately, with the deepening crisis in, in Europe and the looming war that the Lee, of course, had to scale back its activities. And secretariat staff were invited to resign their posts in 1939, or at the very least, to have their contracts suspended. And we're just going to have a look here at um, one of the English translators, Claude Barclay, who was a great believer in the, in the League and, and refused to believe in its demise, really. But his main concern here in April 39 was ensuring that his family was safe. So he wanted to use his home leave to go, to go home to see where he could put his family if war broke out. And ironically, he suggested that they should go to Jersey, where his family was from, as it seemed to be a place, as he puts it, as safe as can be found within the UK. And in fact, it was the only part of the UK which was occupied by German forces. So I hope he didn't send his family there. But eventually he went back to London and we can see here, he sent a telegram to Sean Lester, the acting secretary general from London, this is in 1940, saying that personally he believed the institution will revive, still hoping to serve it despite the prospects. So he, he was loath to resign. He, he wanted to keep his contract under kind of suspended um, animation, if you like. In, the belief that the organization would not completely disappear. Well, a few days later, he actually decided to resign, but still with the strong hope that he would be able to resume service in better times. And he was able to, but not perhaps as he expected. And so during the war, basically, there was just one translator here, um, Edward Lloyd, um, and who was assisted at various times by Georges Meyer. But uh, as the um, course of the war turned in the mid 1940s, more and more work was actually being done because one of the new departments that had been formed, Department Two, which was basically economic financial, uh, had been expatriated to Princeton. And so it was still working away in Princeton and sending documents to Geneva for them to be translated here in Geneva. And here you can see some of the documents that were coming in really quite urgent 
um, documents for the French translation service coming from Geneva. But the League, in fact, did not survive, of course, but it did have the dignity of having its last assembly and be able to wind up and dissolve itself of its own accord. And here we have a note from, a very moving note from Lady Blenna Hassid, who was extremely keen to come back for, if you like, the League's swan song. And she, she, she wrote numerous notes like this to various senior officials within the League, including Sean Lester. And she reminds um, Dr. Stenig here that she'd worked for the League for many years. And she said, I still have in my possession the contract for service during the 1939 assembly, which could never be held. And then she goes on to say that mainly for sentimental reasons, she's extremely anxious to be present at the end of the League's work. Sad though it is for all those of us who believed in the League and served it with conviction and great distinction, I would add. So the League passed away, but of course there were new beginnings. The new organization, the UN, um, kept its distance from the League, but many officials from the League went to work for the UN. And here we can see from a letterhead from Lake Success, there's a view of Lake Success, a converted armaments factory um, just outside New York, where the UN had its temporary headquarters until 1952, I think. And this is from an English translator, McAfee, who says he's quite enjoying the return to the old grind in the English translation section under Samson and Lobosky, two colleagues from before. And it's pleasant to see two many old colleagues making their contribution to the work of the new organization. And also in Europe, there were the new organizations. Georges Meyer, who we met before, returned to the Palais des Nations, but to work for the United Nations. And Claude Barclay, who was so loath to resign, found a job with UNESCO in Paris. Now, there is an enduring legacy of the work of the translators. And I'm indebted to my colleague Anne Getzinger for providing me with this document. And you'll see this is um, some instructions to examiners for the League of Nations examination for English translators in 1931. And basically it's telling them, choose people who have very good English. And what's fascinating about this document is that Anne tells me that in the early 2000s in New York, the examiners for the competitive exams for English translators were still referring to this document. So if proof were needed of the enduring legacy of the work of the translation services of the League of Nations, I think this is a prime example. At the beginning, we, we looked at Ranshofen who said that the League was a great experiment and he was fulsome in his praise of the translation services. So the work of the translation services was an experiment, but it was an experiment that bore fruit. And that fruit contained seeds which had written into them the DNA of the League of Nations translation services. And when those seeds came to be planted in the soil of the new organizations which arose after the demise of the League. Those seeds took root, grew, and have flourished for the last 75 years. And I think our predecessors have bequeathed to us a tremendous legacy. So I think it's entirely appropriate today to pay tribute to them. And as Lord Robert Cecil said, at the final assembly, the League is dead, long live the United Nations. I think I can say long live the translators of the League of Nations. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, so if anybody has any questions, I'd be delighted to try and 
and so on. May I ask a question? 